Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with me here today as we talk about knowledge. Knowledge is power. Um, You've heard that said before, I'm sure, but what kind of knowledge and what kind of power? You see, if you have the right information, you can make the right choices. If you understand a thing, if you know why, if you know where it came from, and you know the what's behind it, then you can make the right kind of decisions. So it isn't that it's going to necessarily allow you to rule the world, but it is more along the lines of it allows you to use then wisdom, and you're going to hear us talk about that a lot today, wisdom to be able to make the right choices, do the right things, and be able to really truly lead and be and learn and grow in all the ways that you were created and meant to do. It's an amazing thing when you have the knowledge, you apply the wisdom to that, and you then use it to powerfully show up in the world as the person that you were meant to be. And that's what we want to look at today so that we can help you be a thriving entrepreneur. We've got three great, amazing guests for you, and I'm looking forward to bringing them to you here so that you can live and thrive in all that you do here as you listen to us on Thriving Entrepreneur. With that said, let's jump in to our first guest. Join me in welcoming Anthony Nagan. Hey, Anthony, how are you doing today? Very good, Steve. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so good to have you here with us. First off, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. What is about me? Well, many people call me a mystique, okay? Um, Mystique is really someone who has realized the wisdom of God. Okay? you know, where his source intelligence is is not his experience or not his human wisdom, but it is divine wisdom. That's really what the difference is. And you acquire divine wisdom. It's not acquiring. You evolve into it by way of intense spiritual practices and disciplines and that and this. Okay, meditations, and there is a lot of things involved in acquiring such wisdom. Okay, so that is really the the book that I wrote about the first one and the second one is a product of that kind of intelligence, that kind of uh, source intelligence. That's where they, that is how it evolved. If it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And so now yeah. you've got a new book that you're working on, uh, yes. almost ready to come out. It's called Divine Engagement. Talk to uh-huh. us a little bit about uh, what is divine engagement? And what does that mean in our lives? See, divine engagement, it really means participation with God in the activities of God and in our own activities. See, allow that kind of a passion to permeate everything we do because we are doing it in the full awareness of the presence of God and the wisdom that we live in. Okay, that's really what it is. It is a concept that has been really, really age old. I mean, in India, um, there was a lot of things that started a few thousand years ago and still very much in practice. See, for instance, I'll give you an example like the uh, traditional medicine, Ayurveda. 
Ayurveda, they say it goes back to five, six thousand years ago. Okay, um, the temples they build. See, the inspiration and the know-how, everything comes from mystical origins, meaning so much divine involvement in it. Their music is like that. Their, I mean, classical music is like that. Uh, their dance is like that. Um, astrology, Vedic astrology, they call it, it's like that. Their philosophy is like that. So many things that, that are so entrenched in the Indian culture, it has mystical origins, or theistic activism. Okay, and it exists and it has been entrenched within the society as they live, and it has been in practice for a few thousand years ago. Now, the problem when we come to the Western world, you see, even the Eastern mystics who come to the Western world, they are only looking for low-hanging fruits. You know, some kind of an intellectual thing that is going to make them money. Okay, that's the whole idea of it. So they kind of promote mindfulness and yoga and all of that in a in a format that can people quickly understand, you know, quickly grasp and uh, and benefit from. Is there something wrong with it? No, I don't say that. There is value in it. But the true essence of Eastern spirituality is not in these low-hanging fruits. The true essence of it is in how we live theistic activism in our own lives. How do we incorporate that? See, when we incorporate that, the magic that happens is everything we do, all of our endeavors, all of our outputs, will have a few elements in it. Okay, number one, it will have a divine intention purpose because it starts from mystical origins. It does not start from a material origin. Okay, secondly, it would be full of passion and emotions. See, so when you look at them, it's like looking at a very beautiful piece of art. It's so much passion imbued in it, so much expression, so much emotions. That's how all of our outputs will be like. You know, when we incorporate active theism, or in my book, it's theistic activism, into everything we do. And the miracle of all of that, when we do, or when we engage in theistic activism in all of our enterprises, the difference is what we do will stand the test of time. See, on the other hand, what happens, you know, the S&P 500 that was started in 1955, more than 90% of the companies are no longer in existence. You know, that's very sad because everything we started had a material origin, therefore it had a material end, a beginning and an end. Okay, Bible says very clearly, anything that is born out of spirit will remain forever because it has spiritual origins. Anything that is born out of spirit, which is matter, will face death because it had a material beginning, it will have a material end. See, anything, in other words, theistic activism is not something that begins with a matter, you know, something that is concrete, solid, let's build on it. That's not how it begins. You know, it begins with so much love, so much passion, so much emotions, you know, and something so incredibly abstract that we can observe and bring the, the, what we observe through synthesis into something that is manifested. See, creativity, or any creation for that matter, it starts 
in an abstract origin. In other words, in an unmanifest origin. Okay, then it goes through the process of becoming a manifested existence. See, for instance, let's look at a flower. Okay, and we see the flower. Okay, it is beautiful. It's fragrant. It is uh, very colorful. It's, and we see how it is pleasing to our eyes and pleasing to our senses. Yeah, we go through all of that. Okay. But when we look at flower from a mystical origin, what the flower has that we don't see with our sensory eyes is life. It is that life that makes that flower so beautiful, so fragrant, so colorful. So enchanting. It is the life that is making it. You see, if without life, the flower is nothing. You see that? So the material beginning, as we see it, will have a material end. But the mystical beginning, which is the life in it, and that will touch our souls and it will just go on forever even after the flower is dead. You see, that is how it is, you know, when we get involved in theistic activism. What we do will have a life in it. And that life is a life that is going to go on forever because it had mystical origins. Okay, see, that is the difference between what we do here, you know, that kind of has a life of its own and it begins and dies, compared to the, the Ayurveda and all of those beautiful things, you know, that are still in existence for thousands of years in India. All of that had beautiful mystical origins. And we can innovate and we can create and we can come up with policy decisions and, and things like that, that could last a lifetime if we engage in theistic activism. See, this is the first time in the history of, of the world a mystic is coming forward to coach people, to teach people how to incorporate theistic activism in their creativity, in their innovation, and in their you know, critical thinking, and in their policy making and all of that. First time ever happened. Whereas in India, then still is the same case. You go to a mistake and get his advice, get his guidance, get his direction. See, people actually don't practice theistic activism they go to people who practice it. So the first time ever in the history of theistic activism, a mistake is coming forward. And I would train people who are inspired to create and to innovate and to think and make policies and all of that, you know, engaging God as part of their creative, innovative process. First time ever. And I will not only train them, I will guide them, I will handhold them, I will take them all the way. See, that is really what my commitment is. And so this book actually is an introduction to theistic activism. I absolutely love that. Well, Anthony, I really appreciate it. We're really looking forward to the book. With your permission, um, uh -huh. while we're still recording here, um, uh -huh. I'd like to uh, jump off a little bit from what you were saying and uh, and give some people a little bit of insight into uh, what the Bible actually is specifically saying about what you're saying. How would you feel about me doing that? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. And I could add to it also if I uh, can. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. No, go ahead, say it. So go ahead, say it. Hebrews chapter 13, uh -huh. verse 1 starts off, uh -huh. faith uh -huh. is the evidence. Faith is evidence. In other words, 
faith is the thing that you can use to prove something. Now let's think about that one for a second. So when you go to court, you know, the things that you can use to prove things are the evidence. Those are the things that are real. Mm -hmm. Hebrews is telling us that our ability to be able to have faith is the ultimate evidence. Faith is the evidence of the Mm -hmm. things that we hope for. Hope is unreal and intangible. But when we add faith to it, then we have the evidence that can Mm -hmm. make those things. It becomes then the tangible. It says it is the substance of things not yet seen. It really is the core of, and we we tend to take it the other way around, right? You know, we tend to end up um, hoping, wishing, believing, working hard to do all those things. When mm-hmm. in point of fact, actually, faith is the evidence. Faith is the place where it starts. And it's in that faith that then we have the proof, we have the structure, we have the foundation, we have the truly tangible that all of these other intangible things are based on i'll give you a perfect example um you know when you fall in love with somebody um mm-hmm. you know often there becomes the question of well how do you know okay mm-hmm. and and you can't like rip your heart out and, and hand it to somebody and say see right here you know there's a little love button um you know but it's the fact that you know that feeling you have the faith in that and that mm-hmm. faith becomes that then tangible connection between your soul and the other soul of the other person that connects you in such a deeply, incredibly wonderful spiritual way that, uh, you know, can't happen without that tangible evidentiary faith that exists in there. Um, And I love how Paul writes that. um, And he says it so simply um, and then moves on. And yet there's so much just in that one verse Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It is the substance of the things that we cannot see. So we believe, and because we have the ability to put faith in the things that we believe, then is when reality truly begins to start versus we see and then we can believe. You know, Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe versus um, those who need us to prove it to them. Um, And I just really, I find a lot of comfort in that, especially these days, you know, because there's some quite a bit actually of chaos going around in the world. And a lot of things that could leave a person feeling very unhappy, unhinged, uncomfortable. And yet when we can step back to our faith and realize that that's the foundation of what we're doing, then everything else becomes the unreal because the faith is really truly what's the real. So anyway, just as you were talking, I uh, that verse came to my mind and I was thinking of that. So I thought it's it should. That actually is beautiful. You know, uh, I'd give you another word. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, Jesus says to Philip, Philip is asking Jesus the question, show us your father. We want to see him. See, for that, Jesus answers, haven't you seen me? I tell you the truth. I see what my father is doing and that's what I do. If you have seen me, you have seen the father. That is theistic activism of Jesus. See, he sees exactly what his father is doing. You see, and we kind of think that, all right, that that vision or that encounter of what father is doing, it is just happening way out there and Jesus has a direct connectivity to it. That's not true. The truth is, see, it is happening in the soul of Jesus, which is the image and likeness of his father. So all he does is, he just looks at his soul. He observes his soul. And the soul reveals to him what the father is doing. And that's what he is manifesting in his actions, in his words, in his thoughts, and everything. It's coming from his soul. 
You see, I mean, we think that, okay, Jesus was God. That is why he was not able, able to do it. We cannot. That is not true at all. That is not true at all. If we believe Jesus came and lived among us so that we could imitate Jesus and live just the way he lived, then it goes beyond that, isn't it? He, he lived among us as a human being. See, so what he is describing that he was able to do as a human being, not as God. So you can see me as God when I can do that. That is theistic activism. I'm see, you know, God created us in his image and likeness. To so, say yeah, the concept of having God inside us, our soul being the image and likeness of God, it is very consistent with the teachings in Christianity. Very consistent. See, whereas now we have learned to live with ourselves as a body, which is really not an image and likeness of God. The body is perishable. God is imperishable. God is the unmanifest. You see, he lives forever. And we cannot compare that to our body and our sensory experiences and all of that. It is much more of a transcended experience than a sensory experience. Okay, that's really what it is. And it is something all of us can learn, especially if we are inspired to think that we have a calling to do something great with our lives, something impactful with our lives. And uh, I mean, it's, it's one such calling, it will pester you all your life. It's not going to leave you alone. <laughs> You can relate to that. Yeah, so oh, you cannot yeah. escape. You cannot escape that feeling. And if anybody who has that kind of a feeling, I am perfectly willing to help them. That is my calling in life, is to help people, you know, and enable them and empower them to get involved in theistic activism. So anything and everything they create will have passion in it, will have life in it, will have longevity. We have everything that I have eternity built into it. Everything they do, everything they endeavor, everything they output. That is the beauty of it. That is the essence of true spirituality. See, from the time of Adam, we were created to produce we were created to endeavor and we were created to create along with God. That was our mission in life from the beginning. You see, but we are too preoccupied with our, you see, our sensory beings, not our soul. When we go deep into our soul and relate to soul and witness who we are as the image and likeness of God, spirituality has a whole different meaning. Whole new meaning, whole different meaning. You see? And it is very consistent with the Bible. It is not something, okay, you know, the Bhagavad Gita has it or the Veda has it, or uh, you know, the, the Buddhist scriptures has it. No, Bible is full of it. Yeah, they also have it, but the clarity and the wisdom and the life in God in our lifetime is more emphasized in the gospel than any other scriptures. Well, I'm really excited about your book coming out. Everybody's got to be ready and looking forward to Divine Engagement by Anthony Nagan. Anthony, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on Thank the show today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you.
and God bless all of you who are listening to this. Thank you. I love the quote, when we fail to learn the lessons of history, we are destined to repeat them. There is so much that we need to know in all that we do in our life and our business so that we can show up powerfully in that wisdom, in the knowledge of knowing what was and knowing how to use it comes the real power. And by that, I mean the capability to be able to make an impact in this world, to do the things that only you can do and to be the person that you were meant to be. Um, so many cool things that we had in that discussion there. And I hope you got some really great things out of that. That was, of course, um, the fourth out of the five people that we made bestsellers over the course of just a week. And we hope that you're going to be next. In fact, to that point, let's take a commercial break and talk to you a little bit about how you could be our next bestseller and you could be a guest here on Thriving Entrepreneur. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskStevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. As we talk about knowledge is power, we look into how we can take information and then use it and apply wisdom with it and then do the things that we're meant to do and make the impact that we're meant to make in this world as we move through the world and we live and we love and we thrive in the way that we're meant to. With that said, um, I'm so excited to bring back as a return guest, my next guest here on Thriving Entrepreneur. Let's jump right into it. Join me in welcoming Elise Woodworth. Hey, Elise, how are you doing today? I'm great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing really good. It's glad to have you here with us. Uh, tell us first a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'm excited to be here today and talk to you about what I've discovered, what I've found in the nonprofit industry, which is really fascinating to me because I didn't, I haven't grown up professionally in the nonprofit world, but I've found myself here helping bring business to nonprofits. And it's been so rewarding. I started my career as an Air Force officer and transitioned from military service into some time as a contractor. And now I have my own company and I help nonprofits overcome conflict so they can get focused on their mission. I do that by sharing uh, my best-selling book, Business Not Battle, with them. And I'm really excited to be sharing with you today. Well, it's always great to have conversations with you. Um, tell us a little bit about this new revelation you've had and um, how you are helping nonprofits these days. So what I've found in talking with nonprofits and working with and in nonprofits really since 2014 is that there is a really strong drive to understand, to know the best way to make a nonprofit successful, to be able to complete the mission, to achieve the mission as successfully as they can, they can do that. Unfortunately, there are so many unknowns and barriers and obstacles 
that exist in the industry, whether it's regulations or knowing that you are meeting all the right standards, whether it's finding funding, having the right people. There are so many things that exist that prevent that from happening. And my, but my experience, what that shows me is that the real problem, the real obstacle that people face pretty much across the board is that they spend too much time tackling battles, putting out little fires or relationship issues that come up. They spend time focusing on that instead of advancing the mission for the organization. And I, we can agree like that's a problem because nonprofits bridge really important gaps in our society. They bridge that gap where industry stops and government falls short. Not only that, we know that more often than not, nonprofits are formed out of a passion for filling these gaps that they've identified. And people are attracted to a nonprofit to help and support because of that passion for filling the gap, whatever it has been identified as. I love that. So let's talk about some basics and see if um, uh, nonprofits are even covering that. Um, we talk about the mission of the nonprofit. How many nonprofits, you know, maybe start off with a really great concept, but they've lost really what the mission is for them? That's a really great question. And I find it so often that a founder will have such passion for a mission, for a particular mission, whether it's a food drive or educating about animal uh, animal rights or ensuring that children are educated and have access to books. So many great nonprofit missions out there. What happens is they say, this is a great mission. I'm going to make it into a nonprofit. And Often, that passion for the mission gets distracted by these different battles, by, oh, I could be doing that too, or wouldn't it be great if I could also fill in the blank? So my answer, my response to this distraction is that we need to bring business to nonprofits by helping them overcome those conflicts and get mission focused. This allows them to ignite their staff, engage their volunteers, and importantly, attract donors that are enthusiastic about supporting their mission. To do that, we need to build awareness, learn to ask thoughtful questions, and grow advocates inside and outside the organization. Now, these are all fundamental elements of the business not battle mindset that I talk about in the book. When we put these together, not only does it create successful nonprofits, both in the leadership and in the government governance of the organization, but it also, you start to see people attracted to the passion because People want to be involved in good things. People want to help achieve a mission. And that's what you start to see is sort of this rewarding loop of as I focus more on my mission, as I use business fundamentals, as I share my inspiration with other people, you start to see those volunteers come in and they're enthusiastic they bring with them donors and more enthusiasm. And what you gain from that is really not just a mission focus, but it's actually mission success. So you start to see that gap bridged that you noticed that people start the nonprofit for. The whole reason they've started the nonprofit starts to be realized. And that is where the real success of a nonprofit comes in. So we have this great mission. Um, we 
put the vision of it in front of our people. Um, and then we deal with people, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, which is really the concept of your whole book is, is that um, we as people get in and we have our own little wars that we fight especially in the board and stuff like that. Um, how do we get away from that battle mindset to get into a cooperative and uh, fulfilling the mission kind of a mindset? Right. Awareness is where it all starts, Steve. It's not only awareness of yourself and of your strengths, but also awareness of the organization. So I'll just take a, a moment to talk about those two things. The first being awareness of yourself, really when you start to look at your strengths as a staff member, as a board member, as a volunteer, you yourself know what you're bringing, but that might not be exactly what the organization is in most need of. So I encourage people to do a, a skills audit of themselves and look not just at their strengths and weaknesses or look at their resume or look through those types of things, but actually think about the values that you have and why you have them, what your mission is and how you can achieve that. What are your not only strengths, but weaknesses what is your education? What are your hobbies? What, Where could you fit in this organization? But then you have to answer that very question. Where do I fit in the organization? And be become more aware of that organization. So if you have volunteers, if you, if you have a position where you're coming in to make care packages, for example. That could be a very assembly line process and you just need to follow instructions. But maybe you feel like you could do a bit more. That's when you start to ask those questions. What more can I do for the organization? And by being aware of your strengths, you're less likely to feel that battle situation, that stress, uh, that anxiety, when someone else has a strength that's being demonstrated in the organization. You can use those as you gain more awareness, as you ask some more questions about the organization, where it's going, how you could be a bigger part of it. And you start to, it starts to create this beautiful picture of how the organization is working and how you could fit into furthering its success. I think that's amazing. And nonprofits need it. They need that reminder of what their mission is. They need a process. They need to really know how to get people bought into. And you happen to actually have written a really amazing book about that besides the fact that you then work with them after that, tell us a little bit about your book, Business Not Battle. So Business Not Battle for nonprofits and their boards is really the mindset that effective board members are going to use to ignite real impact. So back in 2014, when I started on my first board, in my first board position, I looked everywhere for the how do I do this right guidebook. How do I not mess this up? Because <laughs> that's what I wanted to know. And I found lots of literature, lots of books, lots of research on how to form a board, how to lead a board, effective board management, effective nonprofit management. But what I didn't find was how, as a board member, I could show up for my organization. And unfortunately, I had to go through the process of learning how to do that on my own <laughs> for a number of years uh, until I decided to look back at everything I had learned and capture it in a very easy to access, readable book 
that is also an audio book. So you can listen to it as well. Um, and it's just me talking to you about how you can be effective on your board, how you can be an advocate, how to ask thoughtful questions, and if change is necessary, how to lead innovation in a way that is going to create positive change and not get stuck in a battle cycle where you're constantly fighting for the next agenda. You're fighting for the next fundraiser. It shouldn't be stressful. It shouldn't be a battle. It's because you're in business. I love that. And uh, we can get the book course on Amazon. How can a person work with you? Where can they go to connect with you? So you can go to my brand new website, which is elisewoodworth.com. I am available for keynote speaking. I also do workshops and you can uh, buy the book there as well as the audio book. And I really look forward to getting to know as many nonprofits as possible. I find each organization unique and interesting, and I love helping them and seeing boards come together as teams. One of my one of my favorite examples of this was starting to work with an organization a couple of years ago, and I asked a very common consultant question, where would you like to be in a year? And all the board members unanimously and without thought said off the board almost simultaneously as soon as I asked that question. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I'm in for I'm in for a good year. This is gonna be good. <laughs> and using the principles that I talk about in my book, using very fundamental business practices throughout the course of that year was able to create a situation where the board now felt supported, like they had very uh, tangible jobs and things to do. And so at the end of that year, we only lost one board member to family commitments, and we were able to bring on two more board members, two new board members that were going to uh, offer new insight and and boost the energy in the group. And they really have, they've continued to do such great work. And it's been amazing to watch the transformation that they have made possible in their organization to go from stressed out and putting out fires and being in a constant battle of, well, maybe we should just shut this thing down to this is exciting. Let's see if we can what, we, what can we do over the summer? What can we do to maybe move into a new and bigger space because we need to expand this program? So I just really, that really excites me to be a part of those opportunities for nonprofits. And give us your URL one more time. Sure. It's www.elisewoodworth.com. E L I S E W O O D W O R T H dot com. Well, Elise, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thank you very much, Steve. How can you apply the knowledge that you have, the wisdom that you've learned over the years, and then apply that to a nonprofit organization, an organization that's really getting some good things done in this world. I hope that you'll look into the ways that you can apply your knowledge um, and help another organization be more powerful in all that they do. We are so excited about this subject that we're going to actually skip a commercial break and go right into our next guest to talk to you more about knowledge is power and how you can live as a thriving entrepreneur. With that said, let's jump in to our next guest. Join me in welcoming Eric Dodds. Hey, Eric, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Steve. Great to have you here with us. First off, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah, so uh, my name is Eric Dodds. I um, Let's see, I uh, actually am one of those strange people who is born and still live in the same town. 
uh, and I have uh, always been a very curious person, which has led me into the world of data. I've done a number of different things in my career as it relates to data. So I've had some, um, you know, sort of chief marketing officer roles, driving growth with data. I uh, have done a bunch of consulting and I currently work at a data focused company called Rudderstack. Uh, and we help companies collect, unify, and activate their customer data. I love that. So what kind of things can people do with the data once they have their customer data, you know, organized? <laughs> sure. Well, I think that's half the battle. So, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people, you know, one of the, one of my uh, favorite subjects in school when I was, when I was in college, I loved to study statistics on the math side and consumer behavior. And so I was probably bound to do something, you know, with using data to drive deeper understanding. And the deeper I got into my career, I realized, wow, if you have really good data, you can make good decisions. Uh, you can do all sorts of cool stuff, but half the battle, or maybe even more than half the battle is actually getting it into a place that's usable. Um, so just to, just wanted to point out that a lot of companies are actually struggling to get their data in one place, get it in a format where it's actually usable. Uh, so that's certainly something that Rudderstack helps with. But you know, when you think about the outcome of actually collecting the entire uh, customer journey, having it in one place, and then unifying it into you know what you would call like a complete customer record, a golden customer record, a customer three hundred and sixty. Insert whatever buzzword you want. There's so many amazing things. Right off the bat, you have better analytics because you have a more comprehensive view of your customer. But then the possibilities for creating more powerful customer experiences um, really open up, right? So if you have the full context of your entire customer's journey, you have a much better idea of the things that are interesting to them. So you can create personalized content, make better product recommendations, personalize your website or app even. And so ultimately what, that allows you to do is turn that customer data into a competitive advantage for your business, which I think is the goal. I love that. So when you talk about putting the customer data all in one place, are you talking about something that's uh, more like a CRM or um, you know more of a sales uh, pipeline or what kind of uh, setup does your company have? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And this is a huge change that's been happening for quite some time now, probably a decade uh, is, is when it, the trend started, but is really now becoming um, commonplace. And that is actually making the cloud data warehouse the center of what we call your customer data stack. And so you mentioned you know, a sales tool or a CRM, you could think about a marketing tool. You could think about the clickstream data that is used to do web analytics, you know, or, or product analytics. And the traditional problem is that all of those live in their own silo, and it's very difficult to get data from one silo into another. A great example is trying to get clickstream data from website visits into a CRM. They're just two totally different types of data. You know, one's contact records and the other's, you know, time series data. What's amazing about the cloud data warehouse is you can collect all of that data into a single place and then build a customer record that has access to all of the different types of data that traditionally live in silos. So that was a long way of saying the cloud data warehouse or data lake is the way that modern companies um, are unifying their data or the place where they're unifying it. So um, do we have these different elements like the um, analytics from our website and uh, the leads coming in through a lead funnel um, and things like that, we then have them zapping into uh, the cloud data warehouse or how is the information getting into that one central location? You got it. That's that's exactly it. Um, you know, you would traditionally call those like data pipelines. And so you probably have different data pipelines for different types of data. So the lead records, for example, you would you know, use a, an ETL tool to load that structured data in. Um, you'd probably use more of an event type pipeline 
uh, to get the behavioral data in. So all the page views, clicks, et cetera. Um, and so you have these different pipelines that would feed all of that into the cloud data warehouse, which would you know sort of become your single source of truth. So now you and I went deeply geeky because we both love this stuff. But for the person who has no idea what we've talked about this whole entire time, can you break it down more simply? I mean, how does um, you know a customer come to your website? You get the information. How do you use it? That's a great question. You know, for for those of you, and you know, this is I love to nerd out. So I apologize if if I lost someone there. But I think everyone, no matter how technical you are actually understands this concept at a core level. And it's because they've probably tried to combine some data in a spreadsheet, right? I have data from different sources. I need to copy it and paste it into a spreadsheet so that I have a more complete set of data, right? That's exactly what we're talking about. It just allows you to do it on a much larger scale with a bunch of different types of data. Um, but I'll give you a classic example uh, of, of a use case that I think would resonate with a lot of people. Let's say you have a salesperson who wants to reach out to some accounts that you know maybe have been inactive for a while. Well, how do they prioritize those? How do they know which ones are the best ones to reach out to, right? Or which ones maybe they shouldn't reach out to? One of the problems with silo data is that you may not actually have insight into maybe how many support tickets that customer has opened. And so maybe the salesperson reaches out to a customer who has opened five support tickets in the last week, and they're pretty upset, right? And so when the salesperson reaches out to them to say, I want to try to sell you this new feature that we have, they're not going to be very happy because they're not really happy with the product, right? But if the salesperson could see that, oh, this prospect who I was going to reach out to who is inactive, the reason they're inactive is because they've opened a bunch of support tickets and they're blocked. I shouldn't reach out to that person to try to sell them our new feature, right? And so that's just one example of how combining all of this data can give each business team much deeper insight into the type of customer experience that they should craft. That's really the end goal of all of this. It just so happens that you're piping the data into a data warehouse, you know, which you know you could describe as sort of a giant spreadsheet. Uh, you're combining it, and then you're actually pushing it back out to the tools so that every individual team can work from the single source of truth in their own tool, whether that's a support ticketing app for customer success or you know a CRM that a salesperson would be using. All right. So. Um... What sets your company and your product aside uh, apart from others? That's a great question. Um, one of the big things is that we really help eliminate those data silos. So most SaaS tools that you use, whether that's a sales tool, a marketing tool, um, they actually store a copy of the data itself, which is part, you know, that's part of, how they operate so that the business user can access and use the data within that tool. But when you think about combining all of that data, which is really what Rudderstack helps companies do, we don't create another copy of all that data. We actually run inside the cloud data warehouse. Um, and there are a couple of really key advantages to that. So one, from a security and compliance standpoint, uh, we don't persist or store any of your data. It all lives on your own infrastructure and your own data warehouse, which is really big, especially for companies that have you know, particular compliance concerns. Um, two, it actually uh, allows you to involve your technical team in a way that you know, they generally aren't involved because they're not working in the CRM every day. And so a lot of times it creates a much deeper relationship between sort of the business users and the technical users who are helping model that data into a complete customer record. And then lastly, because, um, because it all lives in the cloud data warehouse and you're not creating another copy of that data or paying you know, a SaaS provider to store a copy of that data themselves, there tend to be a lot of cost advantages when you look at you know, the cost of all the various tools that you're using. So those are some of the top reasons that um, 
you know, that companies use RetroStack. I love that. Well, then what you need to tell us is how can a person get in contact with you uh, to be able to work with you? You can head to uh, rudderstack.com. Um, that's rudder like a boat and stack like a stack of books.com. And uh, we'd love to tell you more. And so before I let you go, um, just kind of help us know from a layman's level, what kind of uh, savings it can be to them if they really do get rid of all those silos and have everything working and playing well together? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there, there are two sides to that coin. So um, one side of it is how much more revenue you could drive if all of your business teams had a complete view of the customer. I think that's the most important question um, because that's really the biggest outcome that we see happen inside of, you know, inside of our customers, right? Is that each business team actually becomes far, far more effective. And so on, in some sense, it's more of a question of revenue. Um, the, on the cost savings side of it, I would just look at, you know, I think a good proxy is um, to look at how much you're paying a customer data platform type tool and thinking about all of the data that they're storing and the fact that a lot of your business logic lives inside of a black box. Um, and actually bringing that inside of your company and having much more control is sort of the way that I would think about that as a proxy. You know, what are what are you sort of paying your your customer data platform as a SaaS tool as opposed to that living um, on your data warehouse? Well, I love that. And give us your URL one more time, Eric. Yep, rudderstack.com. That's rudder like a boat rudder and stack like a stack of books, rudderstack.com. Well, Eric, thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So much information out there, but if you don't know what to do with it, if you don't have the wisdom and then to go along with that knowledge so that you can then apply good tactics, good practices, you know what to do with all of that knowledge that you've got. Knowledge by itself is no good. You know, you've probably met one of those people that's kind of an educated fool. And we don't want you to be that. We want you to take and use wisdom with the knowledge that you have so you can show up powerfully in the world because you are uniquely brilliant. You were created for a purpose. And oh, the world needs you. We need you to show up in every way, just as the person that you are, maximizing this incredible thing that we call today so that you can live every day of your life as a thriving entrepreneur. I want that for you. Thanks for joining me. Until we're together again next time, I hope that you have an amazing and great week in your life. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself and tell you, I know the world is waiting on your message and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to askstevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today.